1931, Japan invaded Manchuria. And by 1938, controlled most of China. During those same years, Hitler was building his war machine. In 1939, Germany invaded Poland. By 1941, Germany controlled Denmark and Norway, Belgium and Luxembourg, the Netherlands and France, Yugoslavia and Greece, and then invaded Russia. In 1940, the incredible British fought off the Germans in the air, the Battle of Britain. For many Americans then, the mood was to stay neutral, stay out of foreign wars. Of course, that was not to be. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. The next day, the United States declared war on Japan and three days later on Germany and Italy. Over the next four years, our country was transformed militarily, economically, and in the most human terms describable. It was the most widespread war in history. It's estimated that at least 75 million people died. By 1944, more than two and a half million men and women were serving in the Army Air Corps. Over the course of the war, some 40,000 American airmen died. 18,000 went missing. 41,000 were captured. These numbers seem incomprehensible today. We and our allies in combat and at home paid huge personal prices to save the free world from oppression. Our veteran guest aviator this afternoon is a retired Air Force Colonel. He flew Mustangs with the 357th Fighter Group out of Leiston, England, nicknamed the Oxford Boys. He was a major at age 22, flying two tours, logging 116 missions over Europe. He was a triple ace with 16 and a quarter air victories and is currently the ranking American living ace of World War II. After the war, he continued his career as a test pilot. His last assignment was commanding a tactical fighter wing in Vietnam. All right. You know, I'm sure they're going to regret putting the inmate in charge. Um, so. I have to take advantage of this. This may be the only time they ever let me be in charge here. Um, so I'm Jim Hagedorn. I'm the CEO of Scott's miracle Grow, And that's my bird. Um, started flying as a kid. Um, went in the Air Force, flew F-16s, seven years. And then been lucky enough to meet a bunch of these people here. So um, I thought the way I would set up today is a little different than it's probably been. Of course, the star is that old guy right there who is, you know, truly a legend. And like, no joke, a fighter pilot legend. So the people who are here with me, um, Bud Anderson, and all you can say about Bud is a true fighter pilot. And if anybody's a fighter pilot here, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, he's, he's done it for real. Jack Roush, who has added so much to this ability, 
when I bought my airplane from him, he interviewed me like I was a scrub. Um, and part of it is making sure that if you're going to buy this, you know what it is, that it's a piece of history of the United States, it's important, and that you respect it and share it. And that's part of why we're here. Um, Ray Fowler is a Viper, he's a Viper driver, so another F-16 guy. He's currently flying. He's a Delta guy. He, so he earns, I guess, money that way. Um, but he probably flies more of the unique warbirds that are out here than anyone. So I asked him if he'd be willing to sit with us. And we're going to, the first part of this is going to be really about being a fighter pilot. And then we're going to, and we're going to end that with Bud since he's the ultimate fighter pilot. You know, the highest ace that's living in this country. Um, and then we have Paul Draper. Paul works for Jack. He flies all these birds, just kind of learned. So we've been beating the heck out of him uh, the last couple days, uh, teaching him how to fly formation. And we're going to talk about the design of the Mustang. We're going to talk about how to keep them flying, <clears throat> what's unique about them. And that's kind of how I, I hope this flows. But my notes aren't very severe, so not a lot of notes. <clears throat> I, I just want to throw a little bit out to Oshkosh. This event, so I'm, I'm high right now, um, pretty much high on Mustang flying. So we flew three sorties today, a, I guess a six ship, and then two five ships. The six ship had seven motors because we flew with that crazy twin Mustang that's around here somewhere. That was, Ray was flying that. This place, as an aviator, so everybody's got their thing that they get from Oshkosh. This community, for those of us who are lucky enough to fly fighters here, um, is the one place, one time a year, where every day we will fly military-style sorties, multiple airplanes, just having just a blast. And so Oshkosh, you know, I know that there's all these communities here, and that's fabulous, this community here is really cool. And, you know, so you're here, so I guess you must be slightly interested in it. But Oshkosh is great. Connie Bolin, who's the president of Warbirds, um, when I learned to fly the airplane, which, of course, another one of these jack things, um, he said, you can't fly the airplane until you have 100 hours of heavy tailwheel time. So I had to, and he, but he gave me his T6 to fly. Um, said, if you wreck it, it's, it's yours. Um, and I got the 100 hours. Of, I passed the, you know, my sort of interview with Jack. Not, you know, he is a little bit of a, you know, I, I promise not to use a lot of bad language. Um, but he's a little bit of a butthole. <laughs> Jack made me promise in, no, contract. He had a contract that says I can never change the name of the airplane. And he made it like, he, but he, he didn't tell me he was building another old crow. So I thought it was really unfair. I call that one the faux, the faux crow. This is the real crow. Um, so I thought it was a little unfair, Jack, that you like cheated me like that. <laughs> okay. Um, flying fighters, for me, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I joined the Air Force. This is a true story. I kept it to myself, and I knew I was doing well in the first half, flying T-37s, so it was 1980. And at the end of T-37s, the first six months, my flight commander, this like A-10 driver, Ralph Hudnall, um, says to me, here's how it's going to be, gents. Those people who want to like kill people, you're going to sit on this side of the room. 
And those people who want to fly the killer's toilet paper around, you're going to sit on the other side of the room. Now, a lot of people wanted to be airline pilots, so a lot of people were cool being toilet paper flyers. But he came around to me and he said, so what's it going to be, Hagedorn? I kill people, sir. Uh, so <laughs> that's really like the moment I decided I wanted to be a fighter pilot. It's been a fabulous, you know, it's like today, but flying around Europe back in the Cold War, with the most fantastic airplane in the world, the F-16. It's hard to believe you get paid for this, you know? Um, so thank you, America. Thank you, you guys, for paying your taxes. It's great working for the United States. Um, this guy flies Mustangs. He f flies that twin thing, Corsair, Zero, I don't know, you know, all kinds of stuff. And he's flying airliners. Um, and he flies the F-16 for the Alabama Guard. So maybe a little bit about your view of being a fighter pilot and the F, the P-51, the F-16. Absolutely. One, two. This is on. Okay. Um, thank you, Jim. Um, obviously, it's a, a huge thrill just to sit up here on this panel of these people that are very uh, much more accomplished than I'll ever be. But uh, I'm... Love being involved with this. I obviously enjoy Oshkosh very much. Uh, but same with Jim. You know, part of being a fighter pilot, I actually got involved with the Warbirds of America way before I was even in the Air Force. So I, I was lucky enough to come to Oshkosh uh, in a T-34 of all things, you know, when I was young and didn't really know what I was going to do. But I got to ride to Oshkosh in a T-34 and I said, you know, uh, and I got to see people uh, like Bud and you know, other heroes, and I said, I want to be that guy. So uh, I went down to sign on the dotted line for the Air Force, and that's what took me on the path. Um, at the time, the Air Force was actually banking fighters, and they were saying, yes, we'll get you into a flight school, but it may be a year or more. Uh, and I didn't know anything about the Guard and met someone uh, that was in the Air National Guard. And uh, it's really unique, because most people don't think and don't know what the Guard is. They, they hear it's the, uh, you're a weekend warrior, where the Air National Guard really flies uh, pretty much full time, and uh, I'd say only 40% of the people are kind of your weekend warriors, which would be people that come out and they keep their qualifications, not flying the airplanes, but doing other jobs, enlisted jobs, crew chiefs, fueling, uh, and really they're there to answer the call, and they go to their real jobs, and obviously when we get the call that we're going overseas to go fight the war, that is their full-time job. How many, but How many deployments have you had? I've had uh, five combat deployments. Unfortunately, uh, in 2014, I missed Oshkosh, uh, so I know there's several people right now that are deployed that would rather be here, and uh, I was one of them in 2014. Well, these guys were out flying, having fun. I watched the, the live camera with them taxiing in and out, uh, and I was sitting in uh, Bagram in Afghanistan. So... Again, still uh, nice to answer the call, but this is where I want to be every year. You know, this is, uh, I think uh, Ron uh, Fagan sitting over there smiling, he told me that how excited he gets about Oshkosh every year, and I'm actually the same way. You know, as it kind of builds up, just one, knowing who I'm going to get to hang out with, which uh, uh, I look around and say, how am I here? I don't know how I got to hang out with these guys, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, because of Jim. <laughs> I do give him credit. <clears throat> but uh, it is an amazing thing. Uh, back to the guard. Um, the Air National Guard actually uh, put a package into every guard unit in the country. I ended up getting a couple offers to go fly the F-16. And here I am 21 years later. So I'm at 21 years in the guard and still flying F-16. So it is a young man's game. Obviously, it's a, it's a lot of fun to go out and pull a lot of Gs, which I still get to do. Uh, but uh, only in the Air National Guard do you get to go and start at an F-16. And assuming your platform doesn't change, you get to you know end your career in an F-16. And in fact, we just renounced the F-35. So. Uh, I don't think I'm going to go to school in the F-35. That's a, quite a commitment, about a three-year commitment. Uh, I haven't said no, but I haven't said yes. But uh, it is an amazing thing. Talk to about serve. the Viper and the Mustang. <clears throat> so the, the P-51, the uh, F-16, everybody looks at this airplane. Yeah, you know, I think if you could pick any airplane to fly uh, on the top list, it would be a P-51, right? And the next thing would really be an F-16. And the F-16 has kind of transitioned into the role of what the P-51 did in World War II. So uh, you look at this airplane, it did everything. Um, close air support, obviously air superiority, air-to-air -air fighter. Uh, so they could go out there and do what we do with the F-16 today, which is the same role. Unfortunately, not as much air-to-air. -air. That's what we'd love to do. So uh, we all start uh, drooling, salivating, just the thought of shooting down another airplane, which uh, in the theaters we're going to these days, that's not uh, very practical. However, the support of the the men and women on the ground is what the F-16 really excels at, which is close air support. And uh, most of our time, 
and sorties are basically uh, direct support of coalition forces, U.S. forces on the ground. And, uh, and the great thing about today, we're, we're still dropping 500-pound bombs just like came off of the uh, P-51, except for the ones we drop don't miss. Uh, they're GPS-guided, and uh, uh, you, we could literally, from 35,000 feet, pull the coordinates of the Scott's miracle Grow uh, logo on the ground right here, and it would drive right into this within uh, a couple of feet. So uh, that's the nice capability of 16, and it does good work uh, for America. Okay. So most important guy, most important fighter pilot is is Bud. I, dude, it was it's like elderly abuse. They had him in there. He, he must have signed his name a thousand times in there, like last hour. So will you leave him alone, please? Um, but I got a chance to visit with him and say, look, I'm not going to ask you to tell the stories that everybody's asked before. You know, his, his first combat, actually, we're going to do the first combat only for a reason. Um, Bud was probably the most famous high-angle gunshot guy in World War II in, in the Mustang. So I, I don't know if... If, you know, a lot of these guys are shoot birds and stuff when they're kids, but the guys who can shoot with a real high angle and hit somebody, that's a pretty rare thing to do with a, with a gun. So we're not going to lead with that. I asked Bud, hey, Bud, can you tell the story of your worst kill? You know, the, the story that nobody ever hears, and he said, Dude, I shot one guy down, and I didn't even fire my gun. So, you want to tell that story? A big, hey, first of all, a big hand for Bud Anderson. I don't know. That, uh, <clears throat> that, that story's too embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well... Uh, let me see. One time, I, I had a flight of four, and I was coming home, and we were uh, pretty sour. Well, we were about the middle of France. Uh, <clears throat> come out around the Abbeville, where Does he have water? The, the Abbeville kids were in uh, yellow noses were there, and then... And, uh, they were supposed to be a bunch of bad guys. The, when I'm going home, I had the guys kind of in spread formation going along. Uh, we had plenty of fuel. We had dropped our tanks and uh, burned out the rear tank. And so the airplane was ready to go. <clears throat> so we... Uh, we're cruising along, not not too. I think I don't even remember, but say twenty thousand feet or fifteen to twenty. And uh, I was looking around, and all of a sudden I see a, a high above us four ME one hundred nines. They were in the, kind of in a spread formation. Excuse me, Jack. <laughs> the abuse you take, dude. <laughs> <laughs> These damn things you grab a hold of them and they. <laughs> <laughs> That's for you, sir. I'll spill it all over it, buddy. <clears throat> <clears throat> so I'm watching. And there was a flight of four. And we're going along, and I see this single guy comes out, and he starts right after us. And, uh, you know, a fighter pilot can't talk without using their hands. If I had to sit on these, I couldn't tell you this story. <laughs> so, single guy coming down after us, and so I, bro I had a flight. We just broke into him, and he whew, goes back up, sits. And he keeps tracking us. We got back on our course for home, and they keep coming along. And a little later, he starts again. One guy, we break into him, you know, like we would go head on with him. 
and that's not fun if you'd have to really do it. And he, he breaks off, goes back up. Uh, what's going on here, you know? <laughs> so uh, we keep heading home, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes a single P-47, and he attacks us. He thinks we're ME-109s. <laughs> we break into him. And he pulls up like this, and he's probably looking back and saying, oh, crap, P-51s. <laughs> and while he's going up, this Messerschmitt came down on him, got right on his ass, and... Uh, blew him up by that time the guy had lost all of his energy and he was right here so this time I said by God you've slowed down you're in trouble and I went over after him and I got right on his tail well not ready to shoot and that guy cruises along bails out of the airplane <laughs> So, um, that was the worst kill he's ever had. Sound of freedom. Um, but, you know, the, uh, Eric Hartman always had this view. Is he, he never shot anybody who saw him. He only shot people who just drifted in front of him or, you know, never saw him. Did you ever shoot anybody that didn't see you? What's that? Did you ever shoot anybody who never saw you? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another worst one was uh, later after the invasion when uh, we defeated the Luftwaffe in the spring of 1944. And... What, we killed most of their really good, experienced pilots. You know, the, the, the core of the Luftwaffe was, was killed. And that's how we, that's really how we defeated the uh, Luftwaffe. G General Doolittle took, turned us loose, took all the restrictions off, you know, staying with the bombers, 18,000 foot rule. That's out. Pursue and destroy. So after uh, after D-Day, I think we noticed when I look back that uh, the, the pilot skills uh, dropped dropped uh, was much lower than before, and I can remember being attacked by a a, a, thunk, a single fox wolf. We broke into him, and it seemed to scare him right there. So he ran, and he got into the clouds, and it was just a thin deck. And sitting above it, I could see him. <laughs> and I think he's in there trying to fly instruments and trying to hide. And then uh, here's a big opening up, up ahead. And so I, f I follow him, and I could see him, you know, a glimpse of him in the cloud, thin clouds. And he breaks out into this big open space. And I just slip around on his rear and like that. And uh, I really felt sorry for him for a millisecond or so. <laughs> But I, I pulled up alongside of him, and the airplane was uh, smoking badly. And he uh, popped a canopy, and a huge batch of flame just came right up through the cockpit. It was kind of a horrible sight, but uh, that's another worst one. Worst kid. See, I bet you guys never heard these stories. Um, <laughs> anybody heard this story before? There you go. Um, you haven't read my book, I guess. Let, <laughs> buy his book. He's signed enough stuff in there, so you got, he, like, he paid for it. Um, 
high angle snapshots. Like, so, you know, when you think about shooting somebody with a gun in an airplane, once that bullet comes out of the cannon, the guy's got to fly through it. And most people, it's not low angle stuff. The real trick, and this is, I think, the some of the really great fighter pilots just had a great eye for high angle gunshots. Can you tell us about high angle gunshots? And I guess that takes us into your first kill. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, first kill. Well, but just another thing, because Bud's it's, told the story a lot, and a lot of people have heard it, that he kind of was waiting and waiting and waiting for that first kill. <laughs> and so this is a story about, like, the wait is over, and it's a high-angle gunshot. Yeah, we were, uh, I was leading a flight of four on the way home. And... Uh, Another uh, uh, another flight joined us, uh, uh, same group but just a different squadron. So we had eight, eight or nine, I can't remember, P-51s, and we're going home. I'm leading, and I look up ahead and I see this B-17 down below us, one engine feathered, one of them smoking. And he's chugging along all by himself out there. So, wait, we're back in Germany. So I said, well, let's go take this guy out to the coast. So we head on over there. And out of nowhere comes three ME-109s. Their belly is up to us. We're coming this way, the target, the B-17s down here. They're coming down, going after him. Obviously, they didn't see the two flights of Mustangs, or they wouldn't have come. So I said, all right, guys, one of those is mine. <laughs> 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 so uh, we cut them off at the pass and started getting into a circling dogfight. Well, if you get into uh, perfect circles, you can do something about it. But if you get started wrong and you come at the guy at a high angle and then he's coming at you at a high angle, going around and around and around, and I can't quite get it in tight enough to get on his tail. And uh, he comes shooting by me, you know, at 90 degrees off and same way with me so I had uh, I knew how to shoot I shot quail as a kid I went through uh, one two three gunnery schools the last one being the Royal Air Force gunnery school and I'd done a lot of practice uh, practice shooting because I was a flight leader and so I said, God darn, why can't I get on his tail, you know? And I learned later that a uh, ME-109 in the hands of a good pilot down low could give a Mustang a hard time. So the next time we come around like that, I says, you know what I'm going to do? When he's here, I'm going to pull through him and fire and see if I can't hit him. Now, when I do that, I'm bellied up. I, I can't see him. And uh, I have to have it very accurate. So I pulled through him steady, pulled out here when I thought was a good lead. I can't see him. Fired a burst, and then he comes through. I see him, and he smoke it, cool it. A hot dog. I got him with a lucky <laughs> shot. Wow. I, I uh, overdid my expectations, actually. <laughs> and th then I'm kind of cheering there in the cockpit. And, and then I'm aware of there's somebody just pulled up on my wing. 
and I looked over here, and it was uh, Johnny England from the 62nd Squadron. <laughs> and he was had his mask off. He was grinning like a monkey. And he went some, made some kind of gesture sort of like this. And then he pulled away and got in his flight, and we went on home. Took the B-17 out and then went home. <clears throat> when I got home, I... In our intelligence debrief, I asked my wingman and uh, all that. I said, did, did, have, did you see me shoot that guy down? He said, you know, I was out of position. And, you know, they had two others that we were trying to knock out, too. And I didn't really see it. Uh, oh, Christ. And all the way home, I convinced myself that I probably did not shoot that guy down, that Johnny England came in here and shot it down behind me and pulled up on my way. I don't think that was very sportsmanlike, but I guess the war was on. <laughs> <laughs> and anything goes. I knew it was a lucky shot, so... I didn't make a claim. I filled it out, but uh, I told him to hold it. I have to talk to somebody. So now I'm going over to the officers club, and I'm going to look up John England and get his statement. And how am I going to do this? You know, am I going to say, "Hey, you, uh, well, you jerk! Did you, <laughs> did you, <laughs> did you shoot that thing down out from under me?" And uh, I didn't know how I'd, I don't know how to bring it up. So I go in the club. He's sitting at the bar and he sees me and he comes running over to me and he says, Andy, he says, that was the greatest shot I ever saw. You got that sucker out there at about 60 degrees angle off. I said, oh, Johnny, you know, <laughs> lucky, lucky shot. <laughs> um. Just a, a, a sort of tactical question and how you guys, the strategy, did you expect wingmen to support the leaders or was everybody free just to engage who they wanted or did you expect your wingmen to stay with you? Wingmen should stay with you, protect your rear while you're shooting. So you didn't want them engaged with other targets? No, not, not unless it was necessary, of course. But uh, So um, today... We were out flying, Ray's leading, and we're out on the west side of the lake over here, or east side of the lake, and he says, look, there's a seaplane down there, we've got to go shoot. <laughs> so all of us roll, <laughs> roll in in sequence on the seat, which turns out to be Mark Baker, the head of AOPA. Um, I did see the whites of his eyes. Um, and we took that low, slow dude and just shot the heck out of him. Um, <laughs> how does someone get a quarter kill? That's a mystery, isn't it? Well, a quarter kill, um, you share it with three other people, of course. Uh, you fly on a flight of four, and so I shared it with my complete uh, flight. It's a little bit of a long story. It tells you something <laughs> about the Mustang, too. If you wanted to go, if you're going on a really, really long range flight, and you wanted, and I personally wanted every drop of gas we had, we'd put 208 gallon drop tanks on, but each wing carried 92 gallons. And then you had an 85-gallon tank behind you, right behind you. And what that 85-gallon tank did was made the airplane actually unstable, a full tank. A half a tank, the thing flew like a dream. So we were going to go back into Posen, Poland, I think the target was, on this particular mission. And... Uh, I'm leading a flight of four, and we got this stream of bombers just as far as I could see, pulling contrails, very obvious. 
And uh, we heard on the radio that uh, there was some action up at the front of the column. So uh, we had a head up that way. And sure enough, here's the bombers. They're coming in this uh, long stream. And four AB-109s flying line abreast, beautiful formation, are making a head-on attack. They go through them, shot down two of them, and then they, in formation, rolled over, dive down, and then went to the front like they're going to go up and come around again. And we're back here chugging along trying to get up there, so we drop our tanks. I still have a full fuselage tank. And uh, what that did, the full fuselage tank gave the airplane an FCG. And if you're pulling in a turn, you pull heavy, 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 and all of a sudden the stick gets lighter, 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 and now you end up pushing forward to keep the airplane from pitching up. Uh, we had dropped our tanks, of course, and I'd switched over to the uh, fuselage tank. And uh, so when they come around like, a, like that back, they just started their turn, we cut them off at the pass. And I singled out one, and I got into a turning dogfight with him, you know, one right across, you're just looking right across at him, eyeball to eyeball, going around, around, around like this. Only I'm holding forward on the stick <laughs> to control the airplane. And uh, lots of top rudder, and I'm just staggering around on this turn. I'm just barely staying with him. We go around a couple of times, and we're in right in front of the B-17 column that's going along like this. And we're out here turning and turning and turning, and they're getting closer and closer and closer. So... Um, We're, we're uh, both trying to get on each other's tail, and, and uh, I'm hoping we don't drift, the, with the B-17s don't go right through us, but they're, we're right in their line, and I'm hoping the German pilot thinks the same thing, <laughs> and I'm hoping that he breaks down first. Whoever does that is going to be at a little bit of a disadvantage. So we come around on another turn like that, and pretty soon I can see the detail of the airplanes, the windshield and things like that, of the lead airplane. Oh, my God. The B-17s, if you pointed your nose at them, they shot at you. We accepted that. We knew that was the way it was. And... Uh, so all of a sudden, the ME-109 sticks his nose down, and that gets me right on his tail. He's way ahead of me. He's going down like crazy. And this is a bright summer day, green, just green all over, uh, about noon. And I can follow him get down there and he stretches out and he comes around in a turn like he's going to come back and go head on with me so I, I'm sitting there saying oh what am I going to do get in a turning dog fight down here or no no if I don't do something he's going to get a shot at me coming head on <clears throat> so I got a quick sight picture head on fired a long burst and went by him and my wingman came along here and he says you can't believe how you hit that guy you hit him all over the front of the airplane the cowling came off the propeller broke and um, the guy pulled up like this just rolled over and bailed out fell out of the airplane 
So uh, during this uh, during this dogfight, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow. Like here's a shadow, and there's an airplane down here somewhere making that shadow. And I noticed the direction it was going had to be an airplane. But it's just a shadow I couldn't see, and he had to be low, and I looked and looked, and but I was busy with an ME-109, so uh, I got the flight together and asked him if we, we polished off, uh, I think, two out of the four, and uh, I asked my flight, did you see anything else down here flying? No, oh, okay, get up here. And we're down low now. Remember I said it was a bright green, dark green day. So we're flying along, line abreast. I thought he was going west, so. Pretty soon I saw the shadow again before I could see the airplane. And then we've come screaming up to it and I see this. He's he's right here, and his shadow's right here. And I said, oh, my God. Uh, obsolete Battle of Britain, Heiko 111 bomber. And I sit down low, per, like shooting fish in a barrel. And I thought, just here, there's another easy victory. Then I thought about my flight. And uh, my wingmen very, very seldom got shot to get to shoot when they're flying with me. And so I said... Uh, what a bastard, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said, get into practice gunnery formation. And as soon as I said that word, they knew what that meant. We're going to get to shoot. And uh, when you... When you uh, do practice, you got your t uh, target being towed here, and you get into echelon left, the lead goes in, makes a left-hand pursuit curve, fires, comes over here, and then the second guy does the same thing, the third, fourth, and they get into right-hand right -hand, uh, echelon. And then you come in and you make a right hand pass. So you get a lot of practice uh, doing that. Anyway, these guys, as soon as I said get into practice gunnery formation, they almost collided getting over there, <laughs> getting into formation. <laughs> and and uh, so I go in, he's down low, I fire, I get one, one engine smoking pulled up, noticed that he had a gunner in the back. Second man came in, I think he silenced the gunner and uh, got strikes on the other side of the wing. I'm the leader, so I'm scoring them. <laughs> and number three comes in and uh, he really did a number on the other engine. And uh, he comes up, I score him, he's got hits. Number four was a new guy. He he was okay, but he was <laughs> he was a new guy. <laughs> Says it all. And he goes in and he fires every round of ammunition he had in that one fiery pass. And you don't do that with fifty calibers. You got to fire a few second burst. If you make a long burst like that. You burn out the barrel, and pretty soon you can see the, if you have a tracer, you can see the thing comes out, and it comes out like this. You're not going to hit a thing. But I scored him, too. You gave him a mercy hill? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, now the guy is, is in real deep trouble, and perfectly timed comes a big meadow up ahead of him. And he bellies it in. He, he couldn't bail out. Um, and uh, he's skidding along the thing and, and uh, hit something really bad on the left side and it tore the 
uh, wing off outside the engine. And then the fuselage just kind of spun around like that. So we had two flaming, two big fires going on the ground. And believe it or not, two guys got out of that airplane. And one of them was just standing there kind of looking at it. He, he didn't gesture go, your way? Going around like angry bees up there, you know. And the other guy takes off. And there is absolutely no place to hide. But he runs. Run, he's running and running and running. I said, oh, God, I'm going to give this guy a thrill. <laughs> so I came down like I was going to strafe him and went right over the top of him, pull up, did a roll, and that took the flight home. And that's how you get a quarter of a kill. Uh, all right. I know you, you guys are here. You know what a privilege it is to hear Bud you know, he's alive, he's talking about it, he's sharing his experiences. So I think a big hand for Colonel Anderson. Uh, oh, please sit down. All right. You guys okay if we talk about the Mustang a little bit? Just about the airplane. Um, Jack is going to uh, talk really about the design of the airplane, what makes it special, what he knows so much about, and is a real student of this. So a, a big hand for Jack Roush. Thank you. Um, the story of the Mustang really starts in April 1940 when the British Air uh, Pershing Commission came over. This is more than a year before uh, D-Day when uh, the, the U.S. got blown into World War II. There was a lot of uh, uh, conflict uh, in the population about whether we should be pacifist or, or whether we should be aggressive with this thing that's going on in uh, Europe again. But the uh, British were trying to find uh, manufacturing uh, supply or sources for uh, for airplanes. They uh, was before the before uh, the Battle of Britain, but they they could see the storm clouds brewing and knew they were going to need uh, more airplanes than they could build themselves. So they came over to talk to North American, who built the AT6 uh, trainer and they built uh, the B25 bomber. And they said that they had no experience with fighters, but they'd like for them to build a fighter. They'd like for them to accept a license from Curtis and build the P-40 Warhawk. And uh, the uh, North American group, uh, the engineering and the management both, uh, had a number of ideas about what a future, uh, what the future of uh, fighters looked like, and it wasn't wasn't a P-40. So they, uh, they negotiated a, a chance to do a, a proposal for a brand new airplane. And uh, they, they gave them, the British gave them 120 days, which was the same amount of time that was allotted for retooling the, uh, the, uh, the Curtis P-40 in, uh, in a North American plant and be able to build, uh, build the obsolete airplane. And uh, anyway, uh, the, and, and in, uh, in 102 days, not 120 days, but in 102 days, they, uh, they had an a airplane that was ready for an engine, and they had to wait 18 days for the, uh, for the Air Force or for the Army Air Corps or for the uh, Purchasing Commission for the U.S. Uh, fighters and military equipment to give up an Allison engine. The Allison engine made the, the relegated the uh, Mustang to uh, being a ground support and observation airplane. It really couldn't engage in conflict over the mid-teens. Uh, it it's had a single-stage, single-speed supercharger that ran out of air when, uh, when the fight was above 20,000 feet. In fact, it was above 30,000 feet a lot of the time uh, as, as the war later uh, developed because this, the German airplanes, both the 109 and the 190 that followed it, had uh, adequate supercharging to go in the high 30s. But the Mustang, the, the uh, so-called uh, NA-73X uh, proposal for the British, uh, couldn't do that. 
the 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 North American people had some good ideas. Ed, Edgar Smood was the chief design engineer. He was German born, and he had his ears, his eyes uh, on everything that was being done and around the world. The uh, laminar flow wing that the Mustang is uh, is known for was really uh, explored earlier by the Japanese and the Russians. So they had the, the benefit of some information that had been published by the Japanese and the, and the Russians. They had the, uh, the NASA, North, uh, the National Aviation, uh, uh, whatever the rest of it means, uh, research activity that was doing, uh, uh, doing some things to, uh, to minimize the drag. They also had decided to use the, a V12 water-cooled engine, which gave you a cross-sectional area about half the size of a, a big round Pratt & Whitney engine, and it, it took uh, half the fuel to realize the same performance. So they had the they had the, the V6 uh, profile, or I'm sorry, the V12 cross-section profile. They figured out that if they put the right kind of diffuser on the exit of the uh, radiator duct for the uh, for cooling the engine for the coolant, they could generate some amount of thrust. The claim was made that the the, the scoop that they had would balance the uh, thrust so that there was no penalty for having a radiator hanging down the air. I, I don't know if that was true, but that was one of the things they talked about, and they wanted to flush rivets throughout. So they were, they wound up with a uh, airplane with an airframe that was substantially less, maybe 50% less drag than the P40 uh, or the uh, the uh, P47 uh, that uh, was were also uh, air, airplanes of the uh, fighter planes of the day. Uh, in 1943, 19, late 1942, they put the Spitfire uh, tw two speed uh, supercharged two stage blowed engine. In a Mustang, and it it proved to be uh, fifty knots faster at uh, twenty thousand feet than the uh, than the, the the Spitfire, and uh, so they uh, they knew they were onto something. So by the time uh, Bud and uh, and his three fifty seventh fighter group uh, arrived from Tonopah into the European theater, the the the, the early. Merlin-powered, English-powered, Spitfire-powered P-51 Mustangs were just coming online. And uh, they, uh, they were able to make that conversion when Jimmy Doolittle realized that, uh, that they were going to have to uh, carry the uh, fight all the way to the ground and all the way to the target uh, if they were going to bomb, them out of, bomb the uh, Germans out of the war. There was, uh, just as an idea, the... Uh, bragging a little bit about the American industry at the time. The, but uh, at its peak, uh, the uh, Amer Americans built, the Packard uh, as a supplier for, or licensee for Rolls-Royce, built half the, uh, half the engines that were, Merlin engines that were built by, by Rolls-Royce and all the other suppliers from 1939 to 1955. Packard Motor Car Company built 85,000 engines and when you, when your when your maintenance crew put a Packard engine on your airplane, you had something that had uh, uh, had 11 hours of uh, flight testing. They burned uh, the Packard factory in Detroit burned 80,000 gallons of uh, 115, 145 avgas in developing these uh, and, and proving these engines before they went in the box uh, per day. That's uh, bunch of rail cars, 16,000 50-gallon 50 50 gallon drums. So when you when you got a fresh engine, you had a really good idea that it was going to be good. I, I don't think Bud ever had a mechanical problem with his engine. So we're real proud of what uh, Detroit and what uh, the, the Americans did to support uh, the idea that the British had for, for this uh, really, uh, really, uh, really good engine. The uh, I heard uh, one of the one of the guys talking about the Mustang. They referred to this green airplane as a C model. It's actually a B model. The B models, uh, which were the first of the Merlin-powered engines airplanes, were built in Englewood, California, and the same airplane was built in Dallas, Texas. So it was it was designated a C model. The C models did not go to the 357th. They went to other fighter groups, but it had a B model. There were 4,000 Bs and Cs built 
and uh, less than 4,000 Bs and Cs built. And the airplane that followed it, which is Jim Hagedorn's D model, it's to the left here. They built 8,000 of those. When, Bu when Bud ran his first tour, he had to share his airplane. Whenever his airplane was out of maintenance, whenever it was ready to fly, it flew. There were more pilots than there were airplanes in 43, early 44, in early 44. And uh, unfortunately, the, the green airplane that's represented here was the, was the, uh, was the third airplane that, uh, that Bud had in his first tour. He finished his tour, uh, finished his, uh, tour with this airplane. But uh, two of the airplanes that he flew before, they were old crows, but they were actually shot down with somebody else in the airplane, but with Bud not, uh, not being able to take care of it. But the Jim Hagedorn D model, he flew it his entire uh, tour. There were lots of airplanes. There were twice, there were over 8,000 D models built between uh, the time they came online and the end of the war. And Bud never got a bullet hole in his D model. He got that with one airplane. Um, there were 15,000 Mustangs uh, built in total. Uh, some were built in Australia. Some were built uh, in, uh, in various other countries. Um, but uh, there were 15,000 total, and uh, over half of them were D models. The, the Mustang uh, was cheaper than the P-47 or the P-38 or, uh, or, the, or all the bombers to produce. It was $51,000 of taxpayer money. Uh, to, for a Mustang, uh, minus engine and uh, brakes and uh, landing gear, or engine brakes, landing gear, and uh, some other, and machine guns. Uh, one thing of, before I give it back to Jim that's uh, worthy to note, I know, uh, I know David Hartman uh, touched on it in the, in the uh, video, but from, 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 the, from Pearl Harbor to the end of the war of VJ Day when the Japanese uh, uh, surrendered, there were 170 U.S. aircraft lost every single day. And there were 220 airmen and uh, flight crew lost uh, with those airplanes. So it was a, a big price to be paid. Uh, the Mustangs were at the, at the center of it. And, of course, Bud Anderson. Uh, I enjoy, uh, whenever I have a chance to be one-on-one -on -one with Bud, I tell the people that hear me that... Uh, He's one of the world's greatest aviators and greatest test pilots. He's one of America's bravest heroes, and he's one of my best friends. Hey. <clears throat> Dude, I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, hey, just a quickie on um, Packard versus Rolls-Royce. You know, there's this reputation that the Rolls Motors was kind of a hand-built motor. None of them were the same, and the Packard Motors really were much more of a manufactured motor that were you could the parts were all interchangeable is that true well the packard motor car, that is true the packard motor car company built packard cars before the war and they they were the the cream of the cream of automobiles they were highly priced but they were quality was uh, something really special but every uh, the, there were there were four dashes that were built uh by packard there was a dash one a, a, a dash three a dash nine and some experimental air uh, dashes that never really made it in volume. But every dash number, every dash one, these are dash, that, that came with a dash three, and this came with a dash seven. Uh, every, every dash number, any part from any dash numbered engine would fit any other engine of the same dash number. And the British didn't do it that way. They built engines more like we, we've got a repair station, we build engines today. You look at a part, and if a part's got service life in it, you, you grind it undersized, or you bore a hole oversized, and you fit a mating part for it. And so the parts, uh, the engines are like fingerprints. Every one of them's different with a number of standard and non-standard parts in it. But Packard didn't do that. They, they threw all their scrap away, and they made parts that were standard. And uh, you had not only better reliability, but you had, uh, in the field, you had better opportunity to service the engines. All right. I know it's hot out here. So it's hot here, too. Um, we're just about done. Um, but again, I, th I think it's a real privilege to sort of be here. You know, we there's, I think, a saying for Warbirds America, like, keep them flying or something like that. And uh, I think that's right, isn't it? That's right. Um, we're keeping them flying. So Paul runs a part of Jack's business that is about keeping the Mustang flying and keeping the Merlin going. And he's also a newly qualified Mustang driver. Led his first five ship today. Um, 
You want you want to talk about look what it what it what do you do? Sure, uh, we have one of your FA repair station overhauling the Merlin engine and also supporting the Mustang community uh, with uh, reverse engineering and manufacturing new parts to keep these aircraft flying. Uh, the Mustang uh, itself, the engine is very well supported. Uh, we have uh, a, it basically is about 2,000 hours of manpower to disassemble, clean, inspect, repair all these uh, these parts of the engine. And just inside the Merlin itself, there's 14,000 line items. So there's 14,000 parts on that engine, which is a huge amount of pieces for any kind of engine to have. But it, it all works in, in harmony, and it's a, it's, a, it's actually a really great design of an aircraft um, engine. Uh, the maintenance of these airplanes, it's, uh, it's actually, you can tell they designed this as a fighter. It was designed to be, you know, a machine to go out there and fight wars. And they didn't really think about maintenance that much as far as the, the maintain the airplane for years and years and years as we're in, you know, 75 plus years of flying these things that they were they were kind of disposable. They were they were meant to go out and fly and fight. And uh, and sometimes you get into the maintenance part, you go, how the heck did they get that part in there and how the heck am I going to get it out? So there's a, there's a lot of that you see in the airplane, but the aircraft was meant everything was put in there in such a way to keep the aircraft light to keep it uh, to keep it fast to keep it maneuverable and the maintainability was maybe a little bit less than 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 desirable but uh, just a, a, a quickie um, I don't know if this works um, I've tried to blow a Mer Merlin engine up um, <coughs> melted a piston you know, right now we only have 100 octane fuel, and these things were designed for I don't know 110 or 115. Um, so you're not supposed to overpower. And I was in a dogfight with another guy, and like we all agreed, we keep the power down. And I decided I needed more power. And after that, my engine was just running a little rough, and none of us could figure out why. We started replacing magnetos, and I don't know. We just couldn't quite figure it out until like the end of the summer. This was at the beginning of the year that I probably overboosted it. And the cylinders up in the front, I guess it's one and six, run a little leaner, to, I think, typically. Um, and these guys make shorter, I think, connecting rods to get a little less compression on those forward pistons. But I, I melted one. I mean, I think I went through three or four rings. Didn't yeah. the only ring that was left was like my oil control, the oil control ring. But it ran great, except a little bit of vibration all summer. And when we sent it to Roush at the end of the summer to get it looked at, they pulled the oil filter off, opened it up, and said, you know, there's something is making metal. It was just like silver talcum powder in there. So here's the question. These things seem to, even when they're damaged, run pretty darn well. Is that, is that true or not? That is uh, what we've seen. Yeah, the engine is a, uh, an amazing piece of equipment that even when it's not in good condition, it still runs very well. And it's still a very reliable engine. And some of the stuff that we've uh, disassembled for overhaul flew in. They was flying until the, the, the owner removed it for overhaul and maybe it had a thousand hours on it. but. It was still in perfect working order, except that there was a lot of damage on the inside, and you would have never known that. It was, it so what's was flying. The, worst, the worst engine you've ever gotten back? Uh, wheel case damage. When the gears and the wheel case come apart, that's a bad deal. That's the gear for the propeller? Uh, no, that's the gear that drives your supercharger, it drives your fuel pump, your coolant pump, your oil pump, your camshafts, your magnetos. That can yeah. make a mess? That makes a mess. Um, I think, well, anything you want to add as a new Mustang driver, just the experience? Uh, it's a phenomenal aircraft. I mean, you look at it, and it's a great-looking airplane. It flies wonderfully. Um, you, you read all the stories about it, and you, you're mesmerized by flying the airplane, and then you actually get in it, and you get to fly it. And when you're flying with an instructor, it's one thing. You always got somebody with you. But the first time you go out and solo the airplane, it's, it's just an amazing aircraft you get up in the like I told Jack several times you take off down the runway you start climbing out you suck the gear up and you pitch out and you start turning to your destination your on course heading 
And I, at that point, I was like, this is the coolest thing in the world, being able to fly this iconic airplane. And thinking about the guys like Bud, when you're flying the old Crows and, and Gentleman Jim and all these other airplanes, that it's just, it's an amazing feeling that, to have the opportunity to fly these airplanes in honor guys like Bud and just beautiful machine. So, I, I don't know, we, but we, I think Connie told me, uh, does anybody have any questions for Bud or Jack? Feel free, anybody who's got a question. Any, oh, any quest, questions? They're hot. If, if you can home. ask, okay, there I am. Okay, uh, where's a question? Connie, up there, there's up, a, up, 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 up. a guy with his hand up. That Come one on right down, over dude. There? That one? That one. Okay, The only great. one. The only one, okay. So here's my question. I always hear about the dogfight, but I never hear about the afterwards. You kind of mentioned going back smiling, but did you, after a dogfight like that, did you try to link back up with the rest of the unit, or did you go back by yourself, or just kind of what was the process of getting home after having a near life and death experience with another fighter pilot? Well, no. No, we were... Uh I guess you say we're more on the celebratory <laughs> side of it. <laughs> um, you know, when a guy got a kill, you like to share it with the rest of the guys. And, uh, you know, if you were successful, it, um, it, you got, Well, I don't know how to say it, but uh, when I wanted to do a second tour, I came home and then I got into the pipeline and I had, they said, hey, you have to go see a shrink. I said, what? Well, okay. So I go see the shrink, and he has one question. He says, do you know that you do not have to go back in combat? We have thousands of pilots that haven't seen combat yet. And I said, yeah, I know, but I still want to go. And I had a pretty hard time explaining it to my family and uh, things like that, but it I could tell you, well, I'm doing it for my country and uh, all this stuff, but it was a camaraderie thing with the guys you knew, the guys you knew and you trained with and flew. And so when a guy shot down an airplane, it was, it was a celebration type that, um, aftermath. Thank you, bud. Okay, Ron. Okay, I'm up. We're uh, a little bit of delay on our microphone. I have a young man here who has a question. Yes, sir. So if you could pick one thing that you hated and one thing that you loved about the Mustang, what would those things be? Did you hear the question, bud? No. Worst, What's your... worst thing about the Mustang and the best thing about the Mustang? Well, it got me back after 480 hours of combat flying. <laughs> I got home every time, back to England at least. Um, I felt confident in the airplane. Uh, you know, when you when you first start flying, uh, there's uh, fear, uh, fear of the unknown. And then after you get a few combat missions it's not so bad and then if you're really successful and uh, then it's it seems a little easier the thing I liked about the Mustang was I I felt like me and that Mustang could take on anything Germany had uh, but what was the what what was the worst thing about the Mustang? What was the most painful part of? Well, the, probably the uh, aft fuel tank uh, <clears throat> being giving you an unstable airplane full. Some of the groups didn't uh, wouldn't fill it up. They'd fill it up half full. 
but I always had the guys fill mine. You never knew when you needed a uh, little extra fuel. Did you did you ever depart the airplane? No. No. Did did no. some guys if they were ham fisted lose control of the Mustang, oh, yeah. especially with an FCG? Yeah, you could snap them. <laughs> Uh, you could over G the airplane very easily with a full fuselage tank. You're going if you're diving like this, you're really excited. Somebody's on your tail and you're trying to pull a few G's. You get you can't catch. Did it. the Air Force care if you over G'd the airplane? I'm sorry. Did the Air Force care or the Army care if you over G'd it? Well, sure. Yeah, uh, it's just like the engine. If you uh, ran high power, you had to log, you know, log so many minutes at um, 60 inches or so they could take care of it. <clears throat> Same way they would, uh, I think if it went over a certain G, we were supposed to inspect the airplanes. I, I, well, it really wasn't a problem. Connie, I think you were done. I, I, I think we could stay here all afternoon, and I'm sorry to miss a couple of the questions here, but Jim has a uh, departure slot here uh, going back to work tomorrow. So I, you believe I think, that? You, you, you believe that stuff? I got to go to work. <laughs> yeah, really. So again, we could all listen all afternoon, and uh, I want to thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen. We're standing here next to the people, not only who flew them in World War II, but Jack Roush and uh, Paul Draper. Their, their technology, you can ask any Mustang owner out here, and they'll tell you one big reason they're able to fly these airplanes as safely as we are now is because of the things that Jack Roush has uh, dedicated to producing for this airplane. Jim Hagedorn, thank you, and thanks to you and Jack personally uh, for allowing me and Ray to fly your airplanes, so that's a personal note there. Yeah, don't break it while I'm gone. I, I'll try not to. <laughs> Leave the keys, Listen, though. A big hand for these guys. Please, everybody. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, everyone.